Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Priscilla Berger, and I'm the chair of the Department of Education and the program director. And I want to thank you for joining us for what we hope is the first of many women in educational leadership panels. As we celebrate Women's History Month and also Heritage Week here at Regis, we're fortunate to be amongst some amazing women in this room today, and that includes many of you. And I think we should give each other an applause. <laughs> that was an extra applause. <laughs> We're here today to hear from three incredible women who have each traveled along a different path that brought them to where they are today as successful female leaders. We'll learn of their personal journeys, and it's my pleasure now to start this event and ask Dr. Heather Maeda to introduce our speakers. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Maeda. I, I've communicated with many of you over um, email for over the last few um, weeks, so I'm really excited that you're all here, um, that our students are here. Appreciate the attendance in the room today. It's really exciting. I have the pleasure of briefly introducing three female leaders who, in their own way, continue to have and continue to make their mark in the field of education. First, we have Dr. Nancy Crimmon, president of Becker College in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dr. Crimmon is a highly recognized student affairs professional at the national and regional levels. Among the many awards and recognitions received, she has been honored with the Mary Tobin Senior Student Affairs Award um, from the Massachusetts Association for Women in Education for her work in higher education. Now ranked among the best five schools in the world to study game design, oh, sorry, four, best four schools in the world to say, I must have read an outdated article, sorry. <laughs> it's very hard to keep up with everything on the, on the internet these days. President Crimmon will lead Becker College in the opening of a new center for global innovation and entrepreneurship this spring. As leaders in current um, higher education climate, it's not easy to navigate this, this current climate. Yet Becker College continues to implement innovative programming that is successfully bridging the gap between academic and student affairs. Um, there are a few students in the room who are currently taking an organizational theory, strategy, and change course and are really excited to hear from you today, Dr. Crimmon. Next, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Yvonne Spicer, educator, advocate, leader, innovator, collaborator, change agent, and partner. These are just some of the many descriptors that come to mind when you hear Dr. Spicer's name. On January 1st of this year, Dr. Spicer made history when she became the first mayor of the city of Framingham. <laughs> mayor Spicer began her career as a teacher in Framingham before being promoted to chair of the technology education for Framingham Public Schools, providing that life does actually come full circle. Mayor, Sir, Mayor Spicer, we're very much looking forward to hearing your professional story and what advice you have for us in the room who inspire to make their mark as you have done and continue to do so. And finally, we welcome Dr. Marsha Glines. Dr. Glines has an extensive background in the field of higher education. Now, take it from me as someone who spends a good bit of time researching career theory and development. I can say with a fair amount of certainty that most people take a more traditional route to career advancement, joining the workforce in more entry-level positions and then throughout the years working their way up into more senior-level roles. Not Dr. Glines. After graduating with her PhD, she figured, what the heck? I'm just gonna bypass all those levels and start a college. <laughs> and that's exactly what she did. Dr. Glines is currently the Dean of Academic Center for Excellence here at Regis College, and legend has it that she was dragged out of retirement to assume this role. I'm going to let Dr. Glines fill you in on her fantastic, inspiring details of her career journey. 
All of our panelists will undoubtedly share their inspirational journeys from new professionals to successful female leaders far better than I ever could hope to do so. Please join me in offering them a warm welcome. There it is. Good morning. Um, would it disturb you a lot if I got up? Great. <laughs> I'm Italian. I talk with my hands and I like to move around. So good morning. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here on a Saturday morning and so pleased to meet my colleagues here on the panel. And uh, when I was asked to talk about my journey, I thought, oh, here we go. What can I help you learn. Um, and, and I don't know what you're going to take from this. You're going to take something different from everybody. Somebody out there is waiting to hear something. We don't know what that is. So we're all going to try and hit on as many points as possible so that everyone can find their something. So um, I, I started out um, a long time ago, 100 years at least, and um, very typical college student, changed my major five times in my freshman year, drove my parents crazy. And then I sat across from my advisor and I said, I want to do what you do. And he was sitting back in his chair with his feet up on the desk, smoking his fifth cigarette in the meeting um, with a cup of, I'm not thinking it was coffee, next to him. And he said, okay. And I said, well, how do I do that? He said, I have no idea. I said, okay. So, Long story short, I graduated with a degree in psychology and my senior year did a couple internships in various offices on the campus, which I graduated from, which was Stonehill College. And that man was not at Stonehill. <laughs> um, that was at my college. Before that, I was a transfer student um, from Russell Sage College in Troy, New York, um, a wonderful women's institution. So I became um, really interested in working with college students. I thought that would be great. Well, in 1986, you opened the Boston Globe and you looked for jobs, right? And the only thing available was assistant to the registrar at Curry College. And I thought, well, got to get my foot in the door somehow. So I applied and was accepted to an assistant to the registrar position. So did a lot with transcripts, transfer credit evaluation, um, meeting with students on their academic plans. We didn't call them then that. We just said we want to fit you to finish. Um, everything was done on a typewriter. Transcripts were hard cards, and you typed up a label for each thing individually. Oh my gosh, when I think about that, <laughs> craziness. Um, I actually only stayed there a year because um, I got married, and my um, husband was transferred to Milwaukee. So packed up, wrote a resume, sent it out, and within a week, had a job at Alverno College, School Sisters of St. Joseph Institution, which I absolutely loved. If I could pick it up and move it here, I'd be there still. Um, I worked in academic advising. That little piece of my job in transfer credit evaluation got my foot in the door, right? So I started working with transfer credit evaluations. I thought I wanted to be in admissions because that was really sexy, right? You get to go out and travel all the time and meet new people. Well, I got to try admissions. That's not sexy. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and, you know, 13 weeks in the fall, 10 weeks in the spring, it was a tough, it was a tough, no GPS, no cell phones, flip maps, trying to find a 7-Eleven to make a phone call when you're going to be late. And how do you find a high school? Do any of you know how to find a high school? Well, my territory was Rockford, Illinois, down to Joliet and over to the lake. And not a lot in downtown Chicago. The way you find a high school is you look for the American flag, because it's outside. And in that part of Illinois, there's a lot of cornfields. So you're looking for the American flag above the cornfield, and that's how I found all my appointments. So I um, did that for several years. Um, unfortunately, that personal situation was not good. In fact, as I was driving here, I remembered that I used to be brought here to Regis early in my career to talk to resident assistants about relationship violence. And um, I used to do that at many colleges in the region, and Regis was one of them, actually. Um, so that relationship was not a good one. It was not a healthy one. It was not a, um, a safe relationship. 
managed to move back home, went to Springfield, and got my master's degree. Well, there did a lot of internships, externships, assistantships, every kind of ship you could imagine, <laughs> trying to get as much experience as I possibly could. When I graduated from Springfield and started applying for jobs, um, I had become very close with um, a female dean who, at Russell Sage, was the dean of students. Okay, here's some connections, it's a very small field. Russell Sage, she was my dean of students. I was on student government. I was the social chairperson, equivalent of now a campus activities board, right? So I got to know her as my dean of students. Flash forward eight years later, I'm in a master's program at Springfield. She is now the dean of students at Mount Holyoke College, and we reconnect. That's Sheila Murphy, for those of you in the room that may know her, she's still very active. Okay, so I connect with Sheila, and she says to me, well, you've got a great resume, but you have a big fat hole in your resume, and that's res life. So she said, I suggest you apply for a res life position, or a couple, be an RD, a resident director for two years, you get that live-in experience, it exposes you to every aspect of the college life, and then you can move on. And I said, fine, I don't really wanna do this, but I'd never been a resident assistant, I had never done anything res life related except maybe run from the RAs when I was in college, so <laughs> I had no clue what to do. I applied to one RD job, and I got it. And I sat on my boss's couch in the interview and I said, look, I'm gonna stay here for two years. My mentor said I had to stay here for two years and then I'm out of here. I don't wanna do this. He's like, I really don't care. <laughs> but what I didn't realize was it was July 31st. Does everybody know what happens on August 1st in Res Life? <laughs> Panic ensues. <laughs> and if you don't have a full staff, you're really panicking. He didn't care that I wasn't gonna stay for long. He wanted my butt in that seat right then and there. So um, I started as a resident director and I wasn't very good at it. And I learned a lot. Within a year I was the assistant director. This was at Assumption College in Worcester, Mass. Within a year I was the assistant director. Two years later I was the director and assistant dean where I stayed for probably seven years and then I became the dean of campus life for another 10. So I was there for 20 years actually. 19 years, 11 months, and 24 days as they remind me and put on my certificate when I left. <laughs> um, and had a wonderful experience there, wonderful experience. Started my doctoral program in 2006 at Johnson & Wales, thinking, okay, I think I'm ready for this. It was a really scary decision. Uh, I'd been out of school for a long time. I didn't know how to do online research. I used microfiche the last time I was in school and put dimes in the machine, right? Um, some of you don't even know what that is. <laughs> I know, <laughs> it's crazy. We had to go to the library, yes. Um, so I was really scared about going back to school. You know, there's a financial aspect to it, which I was petrified about. I had two small children, one with severe special needs. My son is on the autism spectrum and he has an intellectual disability. And I was you know, managing this massive division in, in student affairs, um, but had a great supportive spouse. I had remarried a long time before this, so. Um, great supported spouse and um, <clears throat> decided to take the plunge and go back to school. And I did it really fast. I was done in 28 months, um, start to finish. I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> but it was always right here, right? It was always right here. I never let it leave my shoulder because if it left my shoulder, I wouldn't have picked it back up. If you're in a program and you are not working on it every single day or thinking about it all the time or you don't feel guilty when you go to the movies, <laughs> think about this, all right? This is short-term pain. Short-term pain, I talk to women especially about going back to school. Short-term pain, do a vision board, paint a picture with you in your hood. I don't care, male, female, who you are, you need to see it, right? It needs to be right in front of you, and I did that. I had a home office in my work office. I had pictures on, I'm gonna finish this, I'm gonna do it, it hurts. And like I said, I thought I was gonna die. I'm at housing selection, you know, preparing for my defense the next day. Like, this is just craziness. And I've talked a, a lot at conferences about 
to go back to school or not, EDD, PhD or not. And I say it all the time. I've said it to people in this room, right? Do it when your babies are small or you don't have babies because they need you more later than they do when they're small. And, and no, no, my baby needs me. No, your baby doesn't. They go to sleep at 8 o'clock. <laughs> And then you go in the room and you shut the door and you get your work done, right? The high, trust me, how many of you have middle school, high schoolers or beyond? Right, exactly. <sighs> <sighs> so get it done, just get it done. Dig in and do it. This is the one thing you are gonna do for yourself out of everything you do. This is only for you. If you're doing it for a job, you're not going to finish. If you're doing it because you want to make your mama proud, you're not going to finish. You need to do it because of you. It's too much work to not be fully invested in this and to want it so badly. So like I said, 28 months, start to finish, thought I was going to die. Talked to my supervisor, who was a female at the time, about applying to vice president positions. Um, and and I, I started to feel like I was ready. I had a little self-confidence issue for a while. Um, I am also an extreme introvert. I can stand up in front of 7,000 people, and I have, and run a conference. Not a big deal to me, right? But a cocktail party is enough to put me under, like, just, uh, I can't even think about that. Now I'm a president, go figure. <laughs> um, so I have to compensate for that. We can talk about that later, how I've learned to navigate that. Um, so I, I had a lot of self-confidence issues. Can I do this? I didn't think I could be a dean. I was a dean, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't think I could be a vice president. I ended up a vice president. Now this president thing is a whole nother ball of wax. <laughs> so I applied to five positions over five years. Five resumes went out. The first one I got a phone interview and I bombed it. I hadn't interviewed in 20 years. Right? I was so bad that the search firm laughed at me. And that's okay, because I learned a lot from that. Took what I learned, applied it to the next one. I made it to an airport interview. That was great. Didn't go any further than that. The next one, I made it on campus and into the president's office. That was kind of cool. All right, that didn't work out. The fourth one, I made it as a finalist. So it was me and another person. And I thought I really wanted that job. And prepared for it and worked on it and did everything I thought I could do. Didn't get the job. Um, it was devastating at the time, but there's always a reason for these things. So, you know, suck it up and move on, <laughs> brush it off, there's gonna be something else. And there was. A vice president position opened up in Worcester. Now, I live in Worcester, I have two boys, they're older now, 20, 21. My 21 year old is the one with autism. We had 25 hours of home therapy a week. If anyone has a child with special needs, this is intense stuff, right? We were geographically confined. We could not take him out of the school system. They were providing all of his services, I didn't have the energy to try and do that someplace else. My husband also works in Hartford, so he had that commute down and you know, we just wanted to try and, so I was very selective where I was applying, very selective. And so this job came up in Worcester at a school called Becker College. I lived in Worcester 20 years. I lived three miles down the street from Becker and I'd never been on their Worcester campus, ever. Um, <clears throat> We have two campuses, one seven miles away in Leicester, which is your quintessential New England rural campus, and then we have one downtown, which is very urban. Um, so I applied for this vice president for student affairs position, went through the phone interview, I thought, well, this sounds really good, I thought, okay, I like this. Went on campus, got asked back for a second interview, and I thought, okay, this is great. And um, I just met with the president on the second, and he's in a pair of khakis and a golf shirt. Like, he's heading to the golf course as soon as he's done talking to me. And so he talked to me, and then he brought me over to the CFO who was chairing the search. And they exchanged a couple looks, and I sat down, and the CFO looked at me, and he said, I hope you didn't screw this up. And I went, hmm? <laughs> and he said, there is no second candidate. This is all about you. He brought you back because he wanted to make sure you had a sense of humor. <laughs> Tells you something about him, right? <laughs> Um, because I was so serious, 
at my interview, and I can be very serious. And, and I was intense in this interview, and I had the skill set that he was looking for. I had the national exposure in, in NASPA, National Association for Student Personnel or Student Affairs Administrators, <clears throat> which he was looking for. But I, he wasn't sure I had a good sense of humor, and that was really important to him. It's really important to me. So he brought me back for that. So um, I started working as the Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, a huge portfolio, came into a division where people had been working for 20 plus years, no one with a master's degree, no one with formal student affairs training in the division, not one person. Great people, very well intentioned people, but they had been doing the same thing. They were totally and completely 20 years behind everything. I'm not talking out of school, I said that to them the day I walked in. <coughs> So, everyone's always got a lot of advice for a new vice president. Oh, you're gonna fire that person? You're gonna let that person go? You're gonna do this? No, not in your business. <clears throat> because I had to take time to get to know everybody. And there are certain people that did eventually leave, but then there are other people that were sitting in the wrong seats, right? They were in the bus, but they were on the wrong seats in the bus. And once we identified their skill set and were able to move them into that right seat, flourishing, positively flourishing. But they had to be in the right seat. And I think that's one of the most important things as a manager that we have to do is to, is to look at everyone's strengths and what do they need to work on and not concentrate more on one than the other, but develop that whole person. Um, I'm a manager, that's what I do. That's what I do, that's what I've always done. I learned the hard way because I was really bad at it. When I became the director of Res Life at Assumption in 1995, yeah, 95, I had never supervised a professional staff person. And I inherited 10 resident directors and probably 40 RAs at the time. Never had hired, never had supervised. I was so bad at it. I had people coming to me saying, I could do your job better than you. And they probably could have, um, but then that little piece of ego got in their way, and um, that's really not a healthy thing to say to anybody. I can do your job better than you. This is a really small field, so you don't wanna be talking like that. But I did have people say that to me. I, I just wasn't a good manager. I, um, I credit my vice president at the time. His name was Rick Christensen. He has since passed away with helping me become a, a good manager. And he helped me by being honest with me. <clears throat> being a manager of people is really hard because sometimes you have to say things that they don't want to hear. But if you're not telling them the important information about how they're doing or what they need to work on or what they're doing well, you're not helping anybody. So he sat me down and he said, you gotta control your face. Okay. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I can tell every single thing that's going through your head every moment of every meeting. You need to control your face. <laughs> okay. I wasn't happy, but I started to think about it. Then he brings me in another time, and he says to me, you know, I hear something once, and I kind of push it away. I hear something twice, it kind of sticks. I hear something three times, we got a problem. And I've heard something three times, right? You're a little short with people. You need to control that. You need to ask more questions, then talk. And you need to be empathetic. Think about who you're talking with every moment of the day. Who's in front of you? You don't know what their story is. I <coughs> should know that <laughs> more than anybody. You don't know what their story is. Those lessons, I talk about that with my staff still, all the time. The other thing he said to me that I talk about with my staff all the time is, he took a glass of water one time, and he put it down in front of me, and he stuck his finger in it. Some of you may have heard this story. No? Put his finger in, he took it out. He said, did you see that hole in there? I said, no. He said, that's right because that's how fast any one of us can be replaced. Oh. You're not that special. 
you're not that special. Like, what? I am special. <laughs> My mom always told me I was special. It's like, that's different. All right, there's always someone waiting to take your job. There's always someone who can do your job. You need to figure out how to do your job better than everybody else. What I say now, although I, I scared a former staff member, some of you may know Ted Zito, ask him about the water story, because <clears throat> I did it right in front of a bunch of RDs who were not behaving themselves, and said, I'll replace every single one of you. <laughs> but <clears throat> what I talk about now is creating value. This is about creating value. If I haven't learned anything, it's about creating value for your students, for your colleagues, for yourself, for your institution. That's the one thing I've taken away in the past three years. So I started as the Vice President of Student Affairs. We'll talk more about that later. Um, I was the VP for Student Affairs for a year, maybe. <laughs> and then I became the Senior Vice President, Chief Academic and Student Affairs Officer. So no, I was a VP for two years. And in that two years, I was the Interim Chief <laughs> Academic Officer twice. We had a little problem finding a provost. A lot of schools do. Um, then we hired somebody, that was great. I went back to being the Vice President for Student Affairs. He didn't last long. In May of 2016, I was asked to be the interim again, um, which is fine. And that was in March of 2016, sorry. And then in May of 2016, my boss said to me, why don't you just keep it? You're doing a great job with academic affairs. So um, I became the Senior Vice President, Chief Academic and Student Affairs Officer, so running both academic affairs and student affairs. I was tired, but that was great. It was a great position. So um, my uh, former president was getting ready to leave, and he came up to my office, and he said, you're going to be the next president. And I said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I can't do what you do. He said, you don't have to do what I do. You have to do it the way you do it. He's a pretty smart guy. So, uh, yeah, long story short, the trustees made me interim president for about four months and then they confirmed me as president. Um, it has been an incredible journey. It's a very different position. Um, I feel the weight of this responsibility every moment of the day, not just for the students, but for the 400 people that work there. Um, it's a very different chair to sit in for a lot of different reasons. Skill set is important. I've had to learn how to overcome that cocktail party phobia, as you can imagine, right? Um, one of my deans actually told me a little trick on how to overcome that. If we have time, I'll tell you it. Um, but it is by far one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had so far. It'll be a year in May. Um, creativity, innovation, and creating value. That's what we talk about all the time. And in this day and age in higher ed, when things are changing and um, money is tight, regardless of where you are, if you're not creating value, um, that's going to be an issue. Because we don't have the time, the energy, or the resources to hold on to folks, hold on to programs, hold on to whatever, like we used to back in the heyday in the 90s when I had money everywhere. So it's all about creating value for me. And um, mentorship has been very important in my life. I talked about some of my supervisors. I've had some pretty bad supervisors, but I learned just as much from them, if not more, than I did from my really great supervisors. So don't ever discount a supervisor who doesn't teach you anything. You are learning every day what not to do and what to do. Thank you. I guess I start right from here. <laughs> and I actually like sitting here because, you know, sometimes when you are, um, <coughs> you feel sort of like you're, you're in a conversation. And this is my conversation. So I feel like I can just kind of roll my sleeves up and just relax and have a conversation with you. Um, I, I really want to say thank you for that generous introduction. Um, 
it's, it's really been an incredible journey throughout my life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hearken sometimes to the messages I learned early on in life. And, you know, I always reflect on my parents, um, Bill and Dot Spicer, and who have four children. Um, all four of us are college educated. And my parents, neither one of them ever saw the doors of a high school, let alone college. Um, my father died when I was um, 10 years old. And my mother went into overdrive, raising us, um, where she worked multiple jobs. And, and I sometimes look at the opportunities that I had in life, uh, and they were largely <coughs> fueled by what was said to uh, my mother uh, from teachers, you know, in elementary school when teacher said she's very bright and, you know, and I definitely think she needs to be in the gifted classes. And, and that was enough to keep my mother in overdrive or making sure I always had opportunities. Uh, and I, 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 I laugh sometimes because um, my mother sent me to charm school. Um, and um, she worked an extra job so she could pay the expense for charm school. Um, and how she learned of this, this is, uh, was that, um, you know, and I went to Madame Rose's School of Charm, where she taught you to cross your legs at the ankles. You walked around with books on your head and you learned to uh, set a table. I can set a table. <laughs> But I think of why my mother did that. And uh, my mother worked for family. She cleaned houses, and she worked for uh, a well-off family. And, uh, and their daughter went to charm school. So while she cleaned, she listened and uh, heard that their daughter goes to charm school. And she learned to, to call and find out about it and where was the charm school that I could go to. And so I went to charm school. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think about that experience. I also. Um, Think about my father. Um, my father was, uh, as many girls, uh, uh, you know, especially being a firstborn daughter, uh, I was the apple of my father's eye, and, and so was he of mine. Um, he always allowed me to explore. And he said, you know, you, uh, the way you learn things is trying them. And you may not succeed all the time at the beginning, but keep trying. And so at seven years old, I took apart the blender. Because I was very curious how it worked and what was causing it, those little blades to spin around. Now, I took it apart, but I couldn't put it back together. <laughs> and I think my father's reaction was validating. He said, oh, that was so wonderful, darling. That was, baby, that was wonderful. So I said, yeah, let me take something else apart, daddy. <laughs> but I also learned from him that, you know, you, there is no limits to what you can do. And so whether he was working on the car, I was right there handing him the tools, or whether he was in the kitchen cooking something, he would pull a chair to the stove so I'd learn how to cook. Um, and so by the time I was 10 years old, I could cook a complete meal. Couldn't fix a car, but you know, I, I could do a lot of things. And in so many ways, that was preparation. And I'll, I'll share one story. He, you know, my father was uh, very ill, and, and he was ill for a number of years. And I remember as a child having to visit him in the hospital and sneaking. That was when children couldn't come in, and my mother would sneak us in, and uh, gurneys would you'd sit outside, and gurneys going by. And to this day, I have a fear of hospitals. I really do. And uh, it's like, it's, you know, to go to uh, Hospital Row downtown Boston is like, <laughs> a panic attack for me sometimes. Um, so I remember him saying to me, and uh, early on, he said, Daddy's going to heaven. And I said, well, why are you going there? And he said, you know, it's my time. And he said, but promise me something. And I said, what? He said, promise me you will learn everything you can so you can be your own woman. So this was my conversation with my father shortly before he died. And uh, my father died August 26, 1972. Um, I'm getting ready to go into <laughs> your fifth grade here, you know, and, and start my fifth grade year. And so I look at the resilience, and that's the other, the, the word that comes to mind for me is the resiliency, first of all, of my mother, 
uh, you know, 42 years old, you've got three small children and, you know, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 13-year-old, uh, you know, and you're, you're trying to figure out how you're going to make it. And so, and I am in awe of how my mother made it because she did work multiple jobs in order to support us uh, throughout the years. And, you know, and during that journey, because she heard Catholic school, you get a good education. Da, 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 da. She cleaned, she heard about that. She worked another job to be able to afford for me to go to Catholic school. I went to Nectivity St. Peter Claver. Little skirt, bolero jacket, Chris, little snap tie, and a little round Peter Pan collared <laughs> shirt. I had those uniforms. I have to admit, by eighth grade, and I was done wearing those uniforms, I'll, I didn't wear it anymore. But I also look at that experience. You know, my nuns were amazing. They taught you spiritual foundation, but they also were excellent teachers. And whether it was math or science, they were passionate about what they were teaching. And for me, I had a curiosity about the world. I always wanted to know how something works. And sometimes that didn't work to my uh, advantage, especially in Catholic school. Uh, <laughs> when little sixth grade Yvonne decided to question the Trinity, excuse me, <laughs> how can God be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That's three people. <laughs> Nuns didn't appreciate that so much. You know, they kind of thought that was a little blasphemous. <laughs> but I enjoyed that experience. And, you know, and as a result of that experience uh, of being in Catholic school and it was time to go to high school, and, you know, the nuns acknowledge Yvonne's gifted. She has a talent. And, you know, I actually wind up being valedictorian of uh, Catholic school. Um, I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is an exam school in New York City, one of three exam schools. And, uh, and at the time, I took the test, and you know, and I got in to Stuyvesant and Brooklyn Tech. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I would love technical things, so I went to Brooklyn Tech because I lived in Brooklyn. Made sense to me. I had no idea this was a special experience. I, I just thought, Okay, you know, this is, you know, this is a, I knew it was a good school, but I didn't know it was so special. And I went to uh, high school, uh, New York, it's a, a, Brooklyn Tech is a full New York City block long, and it's 10 stories high. There were over 7,000 children in this school, and my graduating class was 1,600 students. So that's just the graduating class, you know, 1,600. And as a result of that experience, I studied technical things, and, and at the time, that's an anomaly, and I went to school during a period of time where they just started to let girls into Brooklyn Tech because it was an all-boys school. Uh, so that was an interesting dynamic. Now, I will tell you, at that period of time, I don't know whether it was intentional, but the school was pretty racially balanced. It was one quarter African-American students, uh, Latino, Asian, and, and white students, it was pretty racially balanced. Uh, it, it has gone completely out of whack of late, but um, I studied architecture. I wanted to be an architect, and that was my major. So it is a technical school with a, um, a strong academic program. So it is, you took four years of English, taught four years of math, and so forth. Um, and you take the regions, because if you're New York City, we, we have the uh, statewide regions, and you have a regents diploma, which is an honors diploma, and I, I did earn a regents diploma. But so, with all that hard work, and I got into, it was time to go to college, and the, the uh, teachers helped me apply for college, because my mother just kept saying, gotta go to college, gotta go to college. I had no idea how to go to college. Mm -hmm. I had no idea, I had not heard of historically black colleges, never heard of it. And so the teachers, and I had wonderful teachers at Brooklyn Tech uh, uh, that helped me apply for college. And uh, you know, I applied for several schools. I got into Cornell University, and no matter how we sliced it, we couldn't afford it. And so my mother, I, the one time I ever heard her cry, it was because I couldn't go to Cornell and she couldn't do anything about it. But thank you, President Carter, because I got a scholarship. 
and he was a very big proponent of these scholarships. Uh, if you do well in school, similar to what we have in Massachusetts where you get a, an Adam scholarship, um, I got a scholarship to the State University uh, with four years, um, it was a four year scholarship which included room and board. I'm happy to say the Ivy Leagues now, uh, like Cornell, like Stanford, if your family is under a certain financial threshold and you get in, you get to come for free. That didn't exist uh, before. So I had a scholarship to the State University of New York at Oswego. And Oswego is lo located on Lake Ontario, uh, the beautiful campus. You didn't, I didn't appreciate it then. It's right on Lake Ontario. And there I packed up my you know, suitcase, headed off to college. You know, my mother's on the bus with me because I got it, went to the program. It was a program that you could go early in the summer. And there's my mother on the bus, you know, worried and, you know, teaching you all the things, you know, pin your money in your bosom and, you know, <laughs> all of this. So all of these things are going on. And my, and my mother's on the Greyhound bus and the driver's like, lady, get off the bus. Get off. <laughs> And I was so excited to be going to college. Here's this kid from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, headed to 300 miles north to, to no man's land uh, that I've never been to. I've never left New York City uh, that far. I mean, we'd go to Long Island and visit relatives, but you know, to leave home. Uh, so I, I wasn't afraid, but I, I was excited with it in anticipation of what could happen. And I, you know, I had this scholarship, and I was there, and I was going to do my very best, uh, and I did. And I discovered education. I discovered, you know, I knew I liked technical things, and I asked an advisor. I said, "Well, can we teach this stuff? Do we teach this? Can how do you learn to teach this? And is there can you get a job teaching this?" And so I shifted. I from wanting to just study architecture to education, and I worked in a summer program and teaching kids about rocketry. And, and the camp counselor said, you are a natural. This is in between my freshman and sophomore year. And, he, and she said, you know, you really could be a great teacher. You probably would, you know, really, you think? And uh, I, it really didn't occur to me. But I decided, OK, let's give it a shot. And I went on to finish the program. I, I graduated in college in three years, and so I got into the master's program. So by the time I was 23 years old, I had finished both my bachelor's and master's degree. And, and by the way, all on scholarship, which was really terrific, too, because I got a scholarship for my master's degree and tried to make use of time. So then, here I am, degrees in hand, ready to go. And uh, I had a, a, a college friend who came to uh, Boston. Uh, she, went, she was a music major, and she went to the New England Conservatory. And so she said, Mom, come visit me you know, here in Boston. It's a nice city. I said, OK, I'll come for a visit. And it's Labor Day weekend. And when you ever told the story of the Boston Globe, she sent me a Boston Globe, and I saw an ad for a teaching job <laughs> in Framingham Public Schools. I said, great, I'll send a resume, you know, I'll see what happens. So I was ready for the weekend here in Boston, you know, I had just came for the hangout with my friend, and I get a call. Well, can you come for an interview at the day after Labor Day? I said, sure, went for the interview. Had a great interview with this guy. And then I had another interview, I had two interviews in one day. And, but the one I really liked was the interview in Framingham. And I liked the guy uh, who was the department chair. And so during the interview, I, I was feeling pretty comfortable with him. And I said, listen, I'm going to tell you, I can teach a lot of different subject areas. I learned to do this. I student taught high school and middle school. I can teach woodworking, architecture, engineering, drawing. I can do it all. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you, I really don't care for that middle school, and I don't care for woodworking. That's not my favorite thing to do. I can do it, but it's not my favorite. And so he says, well, yeah, the job is middle school, woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are stressed with a difficult decision, and you, I like the guy, I like what he was saying about the school district, but I said, this subject area, I just don't know if I care for it. So who do you call when you need to make a tough decision? Mama. Gotta call mama. Ding, ding. And, and this is, remember this, people. Now, some of us, I'm going to date myself. Ding, ding. That's how you called your mama. So I called my mother, told her what was happening. And she says, OK, 
Well, it seems to me if this woodworking in middle school, Yvonne, is your Achilles heel, get in there and master it. And that was a lesson from my mother. So most people go to their first job doing what they're good at, what's their favorite thing. I went to the job doing what I was least good at, or my least favorite thing to do. And I thank my mother today for that lesson because it taught me never to fear anything. And to also know that you can master even your most difficult things. And it has propelled me to do that throughout my professional career. So when I get comfortable that I know something, I'll purposely go to a conference on something I don't know. I purposely push myself in places to learn something new. And that is why I have created a whole swath of experiences that are stepping out of my comfort zone and testing myself and pushing myself to a, a new limit. And whether it's learning a new hobby, by the way, I box. You know, jab, jab, cross, so be careful. Uh, and that was pushing me to a whole no, new level. So that has been something I have uh, strategically done throughout my professional career. So fast forward, spent uh, uh, the first part of my uh, professional career in Framingham Public Schools. I went from classroom teacher being the first female ever hired in the technology education department to becoming the chair of the technology education department. Now, all the years I was there, they told me, oh, we can't find any women. Can't find any. I became the chair, I hired four. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing is pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope on a school district. So I went from uh, being a teacher, and I, be I, um, I assumed my first leadership position when I was 30 years old. When I was 27, I applied to be the chair of the department, an all-white male department. I applied, I didn't get it, but when I was 27, honed some skills, when I was 30, I did. Still an all-white male department. So I was supervising men that were probably, you know, 20 years my senior, and, um, and, and you know, never once feeling that it was out of place or that I lacked confidence. My, and my attitude, we're here to do a job, to serve the children and families of Framingham Public Schools. And I am the shepherd of that. And, you know, and of course, when they would come and complain about this child, I said they're the best children their families had to offer. They didn't leave the A team at home and send you the B team. So the reality is we owe it to each and every one of our families to do our very best. And that has always been my attitude. Um, and so I stayed in Framingham. I had an opportunity to participate in a program at the state level, which allowed me, and this was a pivotal role for me. I, um, it was a sabbatical program where they borrowed me from, the state borrowed me from Framingham to develop curriculum standards for science, technology, and engineering. That was my job and in 1999 to 2001. And as a result of that experience, I had a chance to travel around all of Massachusetts and visit schools. How many of you know where Florida, Massachusetts is? That's right. You, you can't get to North Adams unless you go through Florida. <laughs> and the beauty of it is, is I had a chance to see education across the state of Massachusetts, working at the Department of Ed. It was a pivotal moment. So as I think about that journey, and, and the Department of Ed, and then thinking about state leadership. It also propelled me into thinking about leadership in other forms. Hence, how I arrived in political leadership. I decided to get on town meeting in my community to serve my community, and as we transition from being a, a city, a, a, a town, to a city, I thought to myself, I could bring something unique. Now, by this time, I was already in another leadership role at the Museum of Science as the Vice President of Advocacy and Educational Partnership. So I had been in leadership for over 20 years. And my job at the museum was a startup division. 12 years ago, it didn't exist. It is now you know, from a $5 million operation to a $120 million operation at the Museum of Science. And so I know when I left the museum in January to come here in Framingham as the first uh, mayor of the city of Framingham, I knew I left them in good shape. Being the mayor of Framingham 
is the most awesome experience ever. I am, I am deeply honored, and I will say I thank the people of Framingham. Framingham is 70% white, only 5% African American, and they chose me by a whopping 58% of the vote. And I will leave you with one Dottie Spicer story. <laughs> you are blessed and highly favored. And to those that many blessings are given, much is expected. Always try to be a blessing to someone else. And so as a reminder, I wear this verse. It says, be blessed. And that's my, uh, re my reminder to always be a blessing. So thank you. I think I'm going to leave before you can begin. <laughs> Should wrap it up right there? Um, uh, oh, that was, um, uh, Brad, can you hear me? Oh, Peter, sorry. Put <laughs> oh, my glasses. Um, yeah, we're good. Can you hear me okay? All right, what I'd like you to do first, uh, here, would, you, um, would you put the thinning lens on that camera? <laughs> I just want to make sure I look good. Uh, uh, I'm so honored to be on this panel. Uh, honestly, uh, I, I'm really overwhelmed with experiences and, the, and the, the, um, just everything that goes with being out, putting yourself out there and doing different things. Because I'm old, I, I actually and have a little dysnomia. I have my life right here on my iPad that I'm going to read to you. Um, because uh, I graduated from Emerson College in 1970. And when I tell students that um, I was born in 1948, they think I'm lying because they assume everyone is dead who was born in 1948. <laughs> Why would I say I was born in 1948 if I, if I wasn't? But anyway, um, so I, I, I have a very non-traditional route, and I'm hoping that um, today I can sort of uh, enhance for you some, uh, some, I don't know, some words that will, will also encourage you the way Von and Nancy have um, in terms of just options and thinking about your how you get where you where you end up, um, so I'm going to begin with my first job when I graduated from Emerson as a as a speech and um, theater and a secondary education major was uh, I was on a, I went to Germany and was on taught on the military uh, uh, on a military um, health base. thank you base would be the word. Um, I'm glad I introduced myself as having a little dysnomia, so you can all just jump in there as my students know. And I could have used Yvonne because the first, I was a substitute teacher in a high school. I was just, I just turned 22, and my, they put me in um, all boys industrial arts class. <laughs> Horrifying. Uh, the first thing I said was, please nobody touch anything. <laughs> Do not touch a thing. Uh, that didn't work out so well, so then I was placed in PE. <laughs> and it was softball season. I, I said to the girls in, in, in the class, who knows anything about softball? <laughs> Good, you two, your captains. <laughs> um, but I did learn a lot as well, um, which was, which was uh, helpful I, in, in uh, you talk about failing and not being good at something. Um, in, um, when I came home from Germany, uh, it was the middle of the year, I couldn't find a teaching job, and so I went to a, um, a staff building uh, you know, placement. And the first thing they did was place me in Newton Wellesley Hospital as a food supervisor. You know, I believe that you should eat what you want. <laughs> that didn't work so well. So I, I was only there for a short period of time. Uh, I want you to, I think it's important to know there are failures and you know, just sort of learn from that. Uh, I didn't kill anyone, but you know, probably had a few stomach distress things. <laughs> then the, and then the, um, the placement um, bureau put me in uh, at Morrison Cabot, a brokerage firm where, and similar to some of our experiences, every single stock or bond that was, was bought or sold went through, Kevin, I see you laughing, and I, 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 I it is my life, right? <laughs> so for three years, I worked in a brokerage firm. I was the worst employee ever because my job, there were no computers, I was in the cage, so we were bonded, everybody smoked, it was disgusting, and my job at the end of the day was to add up any, any stock or bond that was bought or sold. Okay, Eugene, where are you? Eugene, <laughs> you know I didn't take math in undergraduate, right? That zoology and botany wasn't kicking in. Every night I couldn't balance the cards because it was manual. So my peers, God bless them, for three years, 
Otherwise, I'd still be there adding up the totals of those. <laughs> you know, AT&T, Texaco, just thousands of dollars of stocks. They helped me. Um, and I really learned much gratitude for that. I was bored. I began to, to volunteer in Charlestown. I was living in Charlestown at the time. Um, it was when um, uh, busing, it was, so we're talking about 73, right? Uh, helicopters on the, the uh, covering people, uh, military police with machine guns uh, up on the roofs of, in Charleston. Has anybody seen uh, the town with Ben Affleck? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I lived it. Mm -hmm. Lived it. That is Charlestown. Anybody live in Charlestown now? Okay, good, so I can tell stories. So, <laughs> my job at, at uh, this teen center, which was housed in the boys club, my job was to bring students in um, from the street and try to um, work with the violence that was out there. Charleston was very violent at the time. Powder keg, anybody, I'm dating myself. Powder keg was a very, there, was, there were arsenals in, in Charleston where many, many people were collecting uh, weapons and sending it over to, uh, to Ireland, uh, <coughs> Northern Ireland in particular. Um, so there was lots of violence. We were held up twice uh, in my little teen center on, uh, at gunpoint. The first time I was in shock, I watched um, um, and uh, chased the, 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 the two young people who came in and held guns on my receptionist, and there were lots of children there. Uh, chased them down to the, to, the, um, to the housing part of Charlestown and then decided we probably would never come back out again if we went that far, so we stopped. The second time, this is where I love the brain, you know, fight or flight, mm -hmm. not always the brightest thing. Second time I saw someone come in with a gun, they stole all our money, we had an open house at the teen center and they knew and so, next time they came in, a young man with a sawed-off shotgun. I, I, I was a little disturbed, and I kind of lost it. There were lots of children. I said, everybody get down on the ground. I went up to the young man. I don't advise. I, I, I don't want you to model after me. <laughs> Picked up the kid because I was so angry. Put him against the wall. And <laughs> he cried because I think he thought, oh my god, that crazy person. And I said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And I realized that after a while, I probably shouldn't be working there because I was getting this violence as the kids I was trying to bring in. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, uh, and there's a lot of stories that go along with that. I, and I was hired full time at the center for a number of years. And I was lucky to, um, before I turned totally violent and, and <laughs> armed myself, uh, was offered a position in the native public schools. Chapter 7, se seven hi, Dr. Marion. You guys went back there. Hi, my dear friend from Leslie. Um, sorry. So, um, so I get hired, uh, interviewed in native public schools. Chapter six, 766 just implemented 94142 special ed. Um, I had a principal, I had no experience. I didn't even have elementary uh, certification. I had secondary. But I had a principal who thought I, I had potential. And so she offered me um, a position teaching. And I stayed in, in native public schools for about five years, earned my master's at Leslie. Leslie asked me to come and, um, and work there full time, which is where I met Dr. Nesbitt, who's on our, our EDD board in the back of the room, one of the brightest women I, I've ever worked with. Um, yeah, I'm only going to tell you that once, Marion. <laughs> That's it. But you have witnesses. Yeah, we do. We have lots of witnesses who know. Um, through my work at Leslie in the, in the master's program in special ed, Part of my job was to go and do outreach and to set up master's programs in other parts of the state where, where for students who couldn't, I mean, it was, online was just beginning again. This is early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. So in that world um, of outreach, I met Michael DeSisto, who um, probably none of you are old enough to remember Michael. He was very controversial, but he ran schools for teenagers who were runaways or who had addiction issues, um, who had tried to at suicide, who were runaways at a school in uh, Stockbridge, Alice's restaurant up there, mm -hmm. and, um, and in Florida. And he said to me, I want you to come down, I want you to start a college program for these students who are very at risk and who probably can't go to a traditional college because they have a lot of history, emotional, behavioral, and learning issues. Um, so I relocated my family to Central Florida in the 80s, Lake County, Howie in the Hills. <laughs> As I was driving my two daughters into town, the Ku Klux Klan was standing on the corner giving out brochures. And I thought, I, I always get the goosebumps when I, when I get to this point, and I thought, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? Stop the car, talk to my daughters about what this meant, what this represented, and thought, um, I was coming out of Cambridge and going to Central Florida in the 80s. I thought what we were going to do would be 
welcomed by the community. So we set up a college program called Assisto College. Um, I'm not proud to say that, by the way, um, it's written up as a frivolous, I'll talk a little bit about the case, a frivolous case, and uh, Del um, Setson Law School uses it, and my name is, of course, on the, on the, uh, the lawsuit. Uh, they use it as, as an example of um, a frivolous case in the state of Florida, so I'm not so proud of that. But um, what happened is we began operating. We offered courses. State, we were licensed by the State Board of Independent Colleges and Universities at the time. We were incorporated. And a year or so into the program, the town decided they didn't want us there. It was one of those NIMBY arguments, not in my backyard, when they realized that we were working with very non-traditional students. And they were angry. And so we filed suit against the town of Howie and the Hills. Um, and, um, and, and because the zoning regulations allowed for schools. It was very clear. To make a very long story, two and a half years in litigation, um, the judge in the case decided that a college wasn't a school. That when the zoning regulations were written, it meant public schools, not colleges. We lost our lawsuit, we lost our, um, our appeal. Uh, and I've told many of my students, I had a $650,000 legal bill that I had to try to pay as head of the program. And um, all the assets had to go back to the town of Howie and Hills. Needless to say, I don't have good feelings about Central Florida <laughs> at that time. So I packed up. It was the end of my marriage at that point. The stress had been horrendous. The town hated me. I will tell you one quick story. When I first arrived in Howie in the Hills, I was invited to the women's uh, club, the women's garden and something club. And I thought, this is really cool. I, you know, so I get up, I'm speaking to all these women. Tell them what I'm going to do in the town of Howie in the Hills and how exciting it is that we are going to really be working with some non-traditional students. And the only question at the end that I was asked, the only question, these are all women, was, Dr. Bynes, how do you feel about taking a, a, a position that belongs to a man? Oh. And I thought she was kidding, so I'm laughing. And then I realized there's not one woman laughing. <laughs> oh, that was serious? Oh, oh, never occurred to me, I, I don't know. At the time when I was finishing my PhD, Dr. William Benjamin was my core faculty at the University of South Florida. And he said to me, did you think that leaving Cambridge and going to Central Florida, people were going to welcome you and love you and love your ideas? I said, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, because they're honest and it's good work. And, um, uh, and the other short story, because so many of you are, are EDD and, and potentially EDD. And so when I did the first draft of my dissertation, um, Dr. Benjamin, who was head of the graduate leadership program at the University of South Florida, said to me, Marsha, every single page that I wrote, he wrote as many red comments on it, mm -hmm. the first draft. And he said, your writing is quite beautiful. It's very Faulkner-esque. However, a dissertation shouldn't sound like William Faulkner's work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I know I couldn't do it. So there's always, I think, as women, too, that can I really do, am I smart enough to do this? Can I do this? Anyway. So I have no job, $650,000 legal bill that I can't pay, uh, give all the assets back to the town. The town eventually blows up the school, it was old, uh, for a, in a Hulk Hogan movie. You gotta love that, I don't know what movie, but they blew it up and it was part of the movie. That's my claim to fame, you know, my school is blown up. Um, I'm depressed, I have no job, I, I've left my husband, uh, left my children with my husband because I am, I, I've had two and a half years of just awful, 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 awful failures in many ways, personally and professionally. So I take a little bit of money, I go out to New Smyrna Beach and sit on the beach with the dolphins and think, you know, what do you do next? Also, I had a number of students who had done two years of college credit through a licensed college but not accredited. What do I do with those students? So the state board helped me. They sent me to a number of different places to find a college who would accept those students in the credits. Nobody would. I finally ended up at Nova Southeastern. Abe Fischler was president at the time. I went into his office. I said, Abe, I have like 13 students. They, they, they have no cr accredited credits. Uh, I, I, would you consider letting them transfer? And um, he said, you know, no, I don't think I can do that. I'm not a crier. I totally broke down a cry. And I'm not sure whether he just felt the honesty of it or whether he thought, this is a crazy woman, she's not leaving my office. <laughs> I just sobbed. I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of the chair. He had clearly stood up and gone to the door like it was time for me to leave. Um, in any case, um, <laughs> he said, okay, 
you know, I think. So in the meantime, a number of parents came to me. They loved the model that I had created in my dissertation, said, if we raise money, we support you, would you reincorporate? Um, we were invited by the mayor of Leesburg, also still Central Florida, but a little bit more sophisticated. Would, would, would you set up a college? Would you be president of Beacon College? And I thought, well, I don't know how else I'm going to get a job, honestly. You know, hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I've got this huge legal bill. I, I had to, uh, we had to cease and desist the last organization that I headed up. Um, uh, yeah, you should hire me because I'm really good at all this. Um, so we did, and um, we set up a Beacon College. Uh, all of us gave whatever money we could. We guaranteed people 5% um, or 6% on their loans if they, because we had to open an account and lease buildings. Uh, four years ago, Beacon um, celebrated its 25th anniversary. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, very cool. I can't take credit for any of that because I left after two years, but they've done great since I left. Um, so I really, but uh, in the 80s, it was very unusual, and it was the first college, first four year college for students who were non traditional. We built in therapy, everybody was in therapy, everybody, every faculty had to learn how to teach non traditional students in college. Um, and it was a very different model. Uh, at the time, Landmark was the only school and it was two years. So um, I left for a number of reasons. Two main reasons. One, I felt like Beacon should be affiliated with a larger university when you look at least restrictive environments kind of thing. Uh, the, and the board disagreed with me, which was fine. They've obviously done fine without me. Um, and the other was I didn't want to raise my two daughters in Central Florida. So I was very fortunate. I was invited by the president of what was College of Boca Raton, now Lynn University. I, to create a program. I was dean of the College of Education. Hated teacher certification. Hated it. Bo uh, hated it. So my learning support program grew to the point where we had three or 400 students coming in for, uh, because they had diagnosed learning issues at Lynn. That program became huge, so we split off. Um, Dr. Berger came into the college um, and was responsible for teacher certification and professional development and so forth. We hired a wonderful dean, and um, most of you have heard my story about, um, we, I would do journey, the Food for the Poor, Journey for Hope. Did one in, um, took a bunch of students to Kingston, Jamaica, and we built units. They're not really called houses because there's no running water or electricity, but we built units for people to, to, who had families to get off the street and, and have shelter. The next year, we were going to do, uh, we were going to, um, um, Nicaragua as well, but there were, the State Department wouldn't let us go. So, so we all were going to Haiti, and most everybody who went was, had also gone with me to Kingston. And of course, we lost our four students in the earthquake, mm -hmm. and the two people who, the two faculty who went, one was Dr. Berger's boss, Patrick, um, and he went for me, because my daughter was having her second baby, and so he took my place. So we lost both the faculty who went one of whom was very connected to Dr. Berger, um, and I, the College of Education was never the same after we lost Patrick. Um, so, here's some of that survivor guilt for a while. Um, the students who did survive came to my house and stayed with me the first night they came home. God bless their parents, that their parents, you know. Uh, and you all know Be Like Brit, uh, the Gengals, uh, Cheryl Gengel has invited uh, Dr. Berger and I we haven't been ready to go, we're, we're now feeling like we can go and we want to start an initiative in education for Be Like Brit. Um, so we're going to be meeting with Cheryl Gengel. It's taken us a while to get to the point where we're okay going to Haiti. Um, in any case, stayed at Lynn 20 years, did a lot of consulting. I've been uh, consulted in Buenos Aires and Puerto Rico and been to Bogota, Colombia a number of times for professional development, helping folks with how do you work with non-traditional students and so forth. Um, retired from Lynn after 20 years. Um, I'm old, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, retired, bored, uh, and um, I went to, uh, knew the president of American College Dublin, who had been the president of Lynn University. He said, come over to Ireland. I went to Ireland and taught at American College Dublin for three semesters. It was awesome. Came home after that, was bored. Uh, I make my children crazy. I, you know, I just didn't like mom, really. And Dr. Berger called and said, would you come and do a little teaching? And I thought, perfect. And I came and stayed with Dr. Berger and her husband and her daughter. And I stayed for eight months. I never went back. You know. <laughs> I like the Saturday Night Live skit where they have the, the, the guest that never leaves. And, left. 
uh, and then finally went home, got my car, and came, and came back when the president asked me to be dean of uh, academic student services and make some changes within the programs. So I have oversight now of the library, advising, learning commons, library, uh, advising, what else, a registrar's office. Not that I have any expertise in the registrar's office. But. So that was kind of, that's been my journey. And two things that I would leave you with. Um, one, sometimes we get stuck with choosing a journey that is very predetermined. And I would say that my life has happened because of all those crazy, you know, the two roads diverged in the yellow wood, you know, the, the, the one that's not even a path. Sometimes it's really important to take those risks, and I think you know everyone here on the panel has, has done some very, very non-traditional things. When I left public school teaching, my parents had cardiac arrest because they said, all you have to do is teach 10 more years there, and you've got a pension for life, or whatever it was. And it was like, but I'm done with that. I need to do something else. And I would say it gets comfortable sometimes mm -hmm. um, to not lose opportunities. And the second is, I would say to you, always look at what exists, what's there. As a college president, as a mayor, you look at the organization, you look at your public schools, um, your programs, what's not there? Mm -hmm. Look at what's there and then think about what's not and, and how you can have a vision to, to move forward. So thank you for let, listening to my story. And that's the reason I have tattoos all over me because when the students came back from the meeting, we all got tattoos. They said, Dr. Klein, you have to get tattoos with us. Uh, okay, I got tattoos. So I don't have a bracelet with the, with the bees. And for the, but, uh, but I have serious tattoos. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>